You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of GHS TV's award-winning talk show Crosstalk. I'm your host, Avery Moore. Each week in this time slot, we take a look at different issues, personalities, and events that affect you and our community. Great stories can often be found where you least expect to find them, and Holly Springs, Mississippi is no exception. This small town in northern Mississippi is full of history and stories to be told. Today, we will head to the Holly Springs Depot and talk with Alexa Ashby, the current depot owner. Later, we'll take a stroll with Philip Connect, who records much of the town's history in his historical blog, Hill Country History. But first, we traveled to the Marshall County Historical Museum and met up with museum director, Jim Moore. Mr. Moore, thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you. This May, you became the director of the Marshall County Historical Museum, but how long have you been interested in history? I've just always had a general interest in history and more American history and Growing up in Holly Springs, just you're surrounded by so much of it. I always was interested in all the local history as well. So it's just always been a, kind of a lifetime passion. While the museum focuses on local history, it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. What does this mean? Well, I, my understanding, man, the, the, the National Register is this an historic I guess landmark of, from a national standpoint and then the building itself is also besides being on the National Register the whole downtown of Holly Springs is um, on the National Register and plus this building is also on the Presbyterian Church National Register. So what was this building before it was a museum? Before it was a museum it was built as a dormitory for Mississippi Synodical College. It, the college was a all-girls school, Presbyterian school here in, opened in, as under that name, opened in 1903 and closed in 1939. In 1939, it merged with Bellhaven College in Jackson, Mississippi. But the really, the roots of the school itself go back to the 1860s and it was, um, Murray Institute, then it became North Mississippi Presbyterian School in 1903. This building was built along with some others and it became the uh, Mississippi uh, Synodical College. So that's, I guess after it closed, I'm really, I think it was like offices for the hospital, the hospital was built next door and um, in 1970 it became the museum. According to your website, all of the display items you have were donated by local residents. Do you continue to receive new items today? Yes, we still get a lot of times when someone passes, they'll call, say, do you want, the, you know, we have this artifact, especially people that have moved away mm -hmm. and, you know, they're cleaning up some of the things of their family, but yeah, we still getting things and really want more from out in the county because a lot of our artifacts here are from Holly Springs and really it's a Marshall County Museum. So we want to tell more of the story of all of Marshall County. So how far back do your display items go? Uh, I know the, from the, in the war room, one of the earliest, we have one artifact from the Revolutionary War. <laughs> and then the majority then really start in the mid-1800s. So when this area started being settled in the 1830s, so 1830s through the Civil War, that's probably the majority of a lot of our collection is, because a lot of it is based around the Civil War and the years following. Do you believe the residents of Holly Springs play a prominent role in preserving the town's history? Yeah, it really is, and I think even more so is we're 
the thing I've really noticed, a lot of people that have moved here really have embraced the history of Holly Springs and like to promote the history of Marshall County and Holly Springs. So it is becoming a lot more of a community effort, I think, than it was in the past. So you would say that it has received the support it needs? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, we're always, like any nonprofit, we're always struggling for money, but uh, we do get a lot of support from the community and, uh, and a lot of support from people who have roots back here that still uh, send their donations and such to support the museum. Now, many people know Holly Springs for its Civil War history, but what's another historically significant display you have here? Uh, one of the, I guess, the newer displays is all the personal effects of uh, uh, Kate Freeman Clark. If you don't know, she was a local artist that studied in New York, that uh, then moved back here, never painted again, never sold a painting, and when she passed away in the 50s, she left money to the city to build an art gallery. Well, most people didn't even know she'd ever painted, and she had actually studied under William Merritt Chase in New York, was one of the premier artists and teachers of the time. And uh, she left money for this museum. They sent to New York, got over a thousand paintings back that were just stored in a warehouse. And my understanding is they say it's the only art museum that's dedicated to one single artist. And uh, we have, like I said, we just completed a room with a lot of our personal items, our dresses, our brushes, our paints, a lot of our drawings. We have uh, books that, from her library and a lot of correspondences with her mother and and uh, different people in the family. So that's probably the one of the more significant things we have here. And then also the yellow fever. We are trying to tell the story on the yellow fever because that was another significant thing in Marsh County or Holly Springs. That Speaking of the yellow fever, reporters played a major role during this time. Can you tell me a little about this? Well, I know that I'm not real familiar with the reporters, but the press did come in, cover that. Several members of the press actually died from yellow fever. In fact, the, uh, then we, over in the, uh, over in the cemetery, we have a monument that's dedicated to the press that, that covered the yellow fever, and also then another monument to a group of Catholic nuns that came here to nurse the yellow fever patients and about and six of them passed away from the yellow fever so it's but the press did have a you know they were here in a large part and a lot of the stories you know the stories about Holly Springs got out in the national press from that. Now the museum was named the business of the month by the Wyhalia Chamber of Commerce in 2014 how do you think the museum has affected the town economically? I think it does help with the tourism. A lot of people see our website, they come here. Uh, once they're here, we really promote the town itself and the county. We uh, like try to tell the stories. We do have a walking and driving map to show people the other points of interest. and. Uh, so, you know, usually people, we get them to stay long enough that they do stay and eat and shop on the square because we do have a few new shops that have opened and uh, kind of maybe geared a little more toward tourists. So it does help promote some of that. Well, Mr. Moore, thank you so much for being here today. It's really been great talking to you. All right, thank you. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will head to the Holly Springs Depot to learn more about its storied past. Hello and welcome to Cable Quiz, the academic... Do you know how incredible it is to work at a TV station in high school? GHS TV is a student-run television station. There's so many things you can do here at GHS TV. You can be in front or behind the camera or both. You have that opportunity. There are no limits. We have 
sports and we have news and we have entertainment. So the students here get a well-rounded view of what it's like to be in the TV field. It's my life. It's what I want to do. From all of us here at GHS TV, thanks for starting your morning with us. For more information about the Kappa program, visit GHSKappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm your host, Avery Moore. The Holly Springs Depot has gone through many renovations over the years, but the history remains. Joining me now is current depot owner, Alexa Ashmead. Mrs. Ashmead, thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. Well, the depot has been around for over 150 years and originally served as the headquarters for the Mississippi Central Railroad Station. But how did this impact the town economically? Oh, well, uh, during the time, uh, Missis well, the South was cotton king and Mississippi was the king of all the states and Holly Springs was the king of kings. And uh, so all the cotton was shipped from Mississippi to Holly Springs. So it was just logical to uh, set up shop here. And the president of Mississippi Central Railroad lived here. And uh, since we were far away from the square, we were kind of out of town. We were a mile <laughs> away because uh, they didn't want the railroad in bisecting their square. So they, uh, he had to set up shops for his wife to shop around to. So that's why they had this place is booming just like the square. Now, some people believe that the original depot burned down during General Van Dorn's raid in the Civil War, but this is not the case. Can you clarify this rumor? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, back then, there was uh, two words for the depot. There was depot supplies and the depot building. And the depot supplies is what burned down during the raid, but the building stayed here. And we actually have the original building. You can see it outside. How can we be sure that this is, in fact, the original building? Ah, good question. Uh, we had uh, historians, uh, historical architects, uh, even Civil War experts tour it and they said yes, this predates the Civil War, so it's still here. Well, how did the depot's transition to an Illinois Central Railroad station impact the community? Oh, very well at the time because, uh, so the Mississippi Central Railroad was here first, then the Civil War happened and they cut all the tracks and so it wasn't really functioning. Uh, when they start putting things together, uh, it was really bad service. And the uh, yellow fever epidemic hit us in 1878, and we were quarantined and pretty much considered a ghost town. So after we were, the quarantine was lifted, Illinois Central Railroad bought us, and uh, they spent put in $20,000, and within six months, uh, anything that has the awning, they built, uh, so the first floor of the dining room that we're in now, and uh, all the way up to the attic they uh, created and they were um, they wanted to leave a mark and say that this was an actual um, there was a new uh, rain in town because before uh, they had people were so scared of leaving the depot uh, because they didn't know if their train was going to arrive in any moment or in five hours and the food was horrible so they're like okay we're gonna put this big building up, it's going to be new, it's going to be different, and they uh, imported fresh uh, uh, produce from the tropics every day, fresh fish um, from the Gulf, and fresh fish uh, from the Great Lakes every day. So twice a day they got fish. They got uh, fresh Kansas beef um, and uh, butter every day, and they actually imported the water. So they said, if you're coming here, you're going to get this fresh bottled water from this magical springs and that at the dining room. So they were making a new mark. Wow, that's very impressive. Well, it was more than just a train depot at this time because lots of notable figures came to meet here, band mm -hmm. members and et cetera. Who were some of the most notable figures that met here? Well, like you said, there would be um, band members coming from Memphis every Saturday and Ole Miss students coming up from Oxford and they would be dancing around all the time, uh, and William Faulkner came here, and actually in the McReaver's, uh, sorry, um, the Reaver's Tale, he has uh, Mr. McDermott, who owned the depot at mm -hmm. the time, the hotel and um, the uh, lunch area, and uh, they would have Irish workers coming up and down the tracks, and they would come here for lunch, 
And Tippy, McDermott's son, would be giving them uh, ham sandwiches, and he sliced the ham so thinly that the uh, workers would complain. And William Faulkner was known to be standing here in the dining room watching and observing everything. And uh, he, he put it in the tails of um, the, Reavers, uh, the, the Reavers. And it has, uh, if you look at it, it doesn't look like Mr. McDermott. But if you uh, try to pronounce it, it's like McDermott. And he said that basically he could slice the ham so thinly that he could take the proceeds of his fam the, on one ham, he could take his whole family to Chicago and back. But like the workers would, he overheard the workers uh, saying that they could see through the ham, read the newspaper <laughs> through it, or they say, turn off the fan, I don't want my ham to blow away. And so William, got, William Faulkner learned <laughs> from that, <laughs> put it in his tales. So it lives on in literature. It does. Well, inventorman and businessman O.B. Kerr bought the, factor, or bought the depot in the 1940s to operate his chicken brooder factory out of. Mm -hmm. out of. Why did he choose this location? A uh, good question. He was living here at the time, and they were going to destroy it, demolish this whole building. And he said, wait a minute, I can put my factory in that. And so this room was actually where he would do the assembly line for the brooders. So he wanted to preserve history for himself. He did. In the 1990s, the dining hall collapsed inward because there were no support beams in the middle. Why was it built this way in the first place? Ah, so when they had the bands coming from Memphis and the students from Oxford to dance, uh, they actually said you don't have to worry about the posts because of uh, flinging your partner into a post because we have none. It's a suspended ceiling. So uh, the problem with that is that when my great-grandfather roofed over the uh, courtyard, it got some water damage and the wall just shifted a little bit. And so there's nothing to support the beams on, and so it just fell. But we were able to put them all right back up. You also started two annual events, Tracks of Generals and Tracks of Art. Can you tell me a little about them? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Tracks of Generals, we have December, the first Saturday in December. And that is, um, since we're on East Van Doren Avenue, it's uh, doing Earl Van Doren's raid, the Holly Springs raid. and. Uh, Pretty much no casualties except for the depot supply that got it. And our tracks of art is, uh, so uh, when the Illinois Central Railroad took this and they built it all within six months, they uh, opened it May 17th, uh, 1886. So we were doing an anniversary of that grand opening. And we have all sorts of uh, crafters and artists that make their own stuff uh, display their craft. I want to thank you so much for being here today, Mrs. Ashby, and I look forward to seeing the rest of the depot. Thank you. So tell me a little about this architecture. Uh, good question. Uh, not many people know about this, but they actually painted all this brick red and stenciled uh, mortar lines in it, uh, January 30th, 1917. And uh, this survey marker shows that we are the highest point from St. Louis to New Orleans on the rail line. And this door was to uh, the gentleman's uh, waiting room, the white gentleman's waiting room. Uh, they separated everyone. Um, behind the ticket office, they had the white lady's waiting room, and they actually had a bed there for the children to sleep on while they waited for the train. But you see how the windows jut out? It's so that the uh, train men could look on either side of the tracks and see the train coming and tell the passengers that their train's crew. Well, these awnings above us are certainly grand. Oh, yes. Um, they are six feet uh, from the wall, and they're held together not by any uh, metal, but wooden pegs. Is this all original architecture? It is. Um, from December 4th, uh, 1885, the Illinois Central Railroad spent uh, $20,000 and got supplies even, um, the roofing material was from Wales. And you can see a lightning rod here, and it goes all the way up, and it attaches to the spire up on the attic roof. This is the baggage room, and uh, during the 1970s, you can see all this new plaster, a train backed into it, and took out this window and the door in the next building. The conductor really should listen to his brakeman. The brakeman said brake, he didn't listen, and he kept backing up. At the time, this was called the colored waiting room. Uh, I like this room. One of them is because it has two ticket windows. All the other rooms have just one big one that's like this one. Uh, we think it's probably because they're separating everyone. There's probably gentlemen and ladies. Is It's the only room that has stenciling, and you can see it faintly there. Tell me a little about Philip's Grocery. 
We had the freight depot and our depot uh, in the 1850s. Phillips Grocery uh, was a saloon back in the day. Uh, also during, I think, around 1852. And uh, they, uh, the markers, the dates on there is uh, off because they were paid to make a mistake because the people that owned it at the time, not the one who owns it now, uh, did not want to be known as a saloon and uh, a brothel upstairs. After it was a, a brothel, they turned it into Phillips Grocery in 1948, and now uh, uh, Larry has it, and USA Today ranked it as the top three burgers to have in the whole United States. Mrs. Ashmead, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. We are going to take another short break, but when we return, we will take a look at some of Holly Springs' historic homes with history blogger Philip Necht. Our program here integrates all the disciplines. Teachers and students have a very um, close connection with one another, and that's how we work and communicate. It's completely creative that they get to essentially design their own lessons. I think it's great to be a part of this program because you get to have a very close relationship with your teachers as well as your peers. Making art is self-discovery and the world without art is a world without art. For more information about the CAPA program, visit GHSCAPA.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Hello and welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm your host, Avery Moore. Historic homes always have a little bit of history, but some more than others. Here with me now is Mr. Philip Connett to walk with us through this historic neighborhood in Holly Springs. Mr. Connett, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Well, we're in this neighborhood in Holly Springs, but what makes it so special? Well, this street is named Chilahoma uh, Avenue after the town of Chilahoma. Today is a ghost town. <laughs> uh, back when this street was founded and the city of Holly Springs was founded, it would have been a major center. Uh, but this area of town would have been in the outskirts of Holly Springs, so houses like this, like Walter Place and some of the others around here, would have been built out here by the rich people of the time because there's a lot of land out here. Well, now, the Walter Place here in front of us is most famous for General Grant's temporary stay here. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, Walter Place was actually the very last major antebellum mansion built in, this, in the uh, state of Mississippi. It was built in 1859 by Harvey Walter. This is Mr. Walter right here. Harvey Walter was originally from Ohio. He came here um, as a fairly young man. He was actually responsible for building the Mississippi Central Railroad, um, which was a major undertaking of the time. During the Civil War, he actually did not support uh, segregation and succession, uh, so he actually uh, did not support the Confederacy. So during the war, he actually allowed General Grant, who was leading the Union Army at the time, and his wife Julia to stay here for a few days in 1862. Well, rumor has it that General Grant hid in one of the columns. Is this true? It's not really true. Uh, the legend associated with uh, this house is that Julia Grant was captured here, or she was almost captured during Van Dorn's raid of December 1862. She was actually in uh, Oxford at the time, uh, although her materials inside, her war materials, were almost captured. It wasn't for her, one of her serving ladies refused to allow the Confederates to enter the house, save both the house and the war papers. Like a lot of legends in this town got kind of mixed up over, over the centuries, over the decades, uh, but more or less is true. Now, General Grant also stayed in uh, a house called Arleydale. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, it's Early Wood, and Early Wood is across town. Um, it's very similar to this house. Uh, Early Wood is Gothic Revival. Walter Place actually melds both the Greek Revival architecture, which you can see by the columns here, and the Gothic Revival, which you can see by the uh, turrets on either side of the house. Gothic Revival's uh, built just like the castles of, of medieval Europe. Now I hear you have some other homes to show us today. Sure we do. Uh, across the street is the Governor Matthews house. Uh, not quite as majestic as Walter Place, but have just as much history. So tell me a little about this house. Well, nowadays they call this house the Holly, but uh, in uh, about a century ago it was called the Governor Matthews House. Named after this gentleman, his name is uh, was Governor Matthews. Uh, he was the only governor of Mississippi from Holly Springs. Um, he was a very simple man, a farmer, who has a farm outside of town as well. Uh, when he went to the legislature, when he became governor, uh, he was most known for founding the University of Mississippi when he was the governor. 
Well, now Wakefield, located less than a mile away, is said to be home to a scandalous affair. Can you tell me a little more about this? It's absolutely a uh, great story of a scandalous affair. Uh, a widow was living in, in Wakefield during the Civil War. Her husband died fighting in the Confederacy. Uh, after the war, or after the war during Reconstruction, Holly Springs was occupied by the Union Army, and one of the officers of the Union Army actually took her house from her and uh, forced her to leave, actually forced her to go to the second floor. And uh, at some point, she fell in love with this gentleman, became very scandalous, as you imagine, in the uh, post-Civil War South. Um, in fact, um, a local writer, Sherwood Bonner, wrote a novel called Like Unto Like, based off of that story. Now, you mentioned a house called the Kuffawa House. Can you tell me a little about this home? Actually, the Kuffawa is actually just down the street. Uh, Kuffawa is a very early house built uh, actually as a log cabin, which is what all houses wow. in the very earliest times, 1830s, were built before they had access to the uh, stones and, uh, and wood of the other houses. It is a very old house, probably one of the oldest houses in town. Now, the Featherston Place isn't located on this street, but it's now regarded as one of the most haunted homes in Holly Springs, haunted by the ghost of Liz Lizzie McEwen. Can you tell us her story? Uh, Lizzie McEwen actually was uh, the daughter of Alexander McEwen, who's one of the founders of Holly Springs. In fact, we believe Alexander McEwen gave this town his name. He had the very first store in town in 1835, and when a package came to be delivered, he, they asked, who do we sign this to? And he said, the Holly Springs, because he was at the Springs where the Holly Traders were at the time. Uh, his daughter, Lizzie McEwen, was, lived there for many years, uh, actually married General Featherston, who was a Civil War general at the time. She unfortunately, along with almost all of her children, died in the Great Yellow Fever of 1878, which killed a large portion of this town. Now, so the yellow fever epidemic was very significant here. Can you tell me a little more about how it impacted the town? Well, the yellow fever at the time, uh, we didn't believe the yellow fever would affect the town like it did. At the time, it was believed the yellow fever was spread by on the air, so the air would blow it in. Holly Springs is located on hills, pretty high up in the hill country, so we didn't think, we thought we'd be immune to it. That's why we let refugees from Batesville come in with the yellow fever. There's a uh, house right outside the square called the Yellow Fever House. And that's where yellow fever began this town. Um, the victims died. It was spread to the other community. Uh, as many of people as possible left the town, but over 300 people died of the yellow fever. It affected, it took decades for our town to recover. Well, you're a self-employed attorney by day, but you also write the Hill Country History blog recording a lot of Holly Springs history. When did you first become interested in history? I've been, I was interested in history long before I was interested in law. Uh, law pays the bills, but history is my passion. Um, I started the blog about three years ago when I, uh, I moved to town about 10 years ago, but I decided to start compiling a lot of the things I had, a lot of the history, a lot of the pictures, and I put the, all that on the blog. Um, I also run the uh, Haunted Holly Springs tours as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about the Haunted Holly Springs tours? Yes, in tours? fact, we have an event coming up soon on July 29th at the museum, which you uh, visited earlier, called Ghosts at the Museums, where we'll be doing a walking tour of College Avenue, which is another uh, street further across town that I live on and the museum's on. And we'll also be doing uh, ghost tours and all that in, in the building. In October, we have our main tours. We uh, have almost a thousand people come in from all over North Mississippi for our ghost tours. All around, we have uh, people dressed up in costume and tell the stories. Most of the stories are true. Uh, in a town like this, that's this old has a lot of death associated with it. Well, Mr. Kennett, we've run out of time, but this has been a very interesting conversation. Th thank you so much for being thank here today. You. While only the skeletons of history remain here in Holly Springs, the lessons we learn from our history are invaluable. I want to thank my guests today for shedding some light on the hidden history of Holly Springs. I'm Avery Moore. From all of us at GHS-TV, thank you for watching Crosstalk, and I hope to see you again.